We now have more religious freedom with that 1971 Lemon case gone than we have had for 50 years. You're in a situation where you've been in a cage for 50 years. Now the door's open. What do people do? They still want to stay in the cage. We need to encourage people to go out and exercise their freedom. Hey, I'm joined with Matt Staver. Matt is the founder and chairman at Liberty Council. Matt, thank you so much for being with us on our program. Love what you're doing. Uh, can you tell us, tell our audience about Liberty Council and all the work that you guys are doing? Sure, it's my pleasure to be with you. And I love your name too, by the way. It's a but good name. It is biblical a biblical name. name. It's a biblical <laughs> name. But Liberty Council, we founded it in 1989 and it advances religious freedom the sanctity of human life, and God's design for marriage and family. We do that in three different ways, through litigation in the courts, through education, and through public policy. And we advance these particular areas to really biblical values and try to set new precedent that will last for generations. I love it. I love it. You were just doing some litigation some arguments in the supreme court in one of the states uh tell us a little bit about that that was concerning life in florida tell us a little bit about that and then why is that so important for other people who may not be in the state of florida but why do they need to be concerned about what's happening there well in florida planned parenthood and the aclu got together along with other abortion advocates to propose a constitutional amendment to florida's constitution it's the most radical provision that would literally eliminate every law, every regulation, except for possibly parental notification with a very many exceptions to it. Yeah. Every other law, including health exceptions, uh, safety exceptions, safety rules and regulations, all of those would be overturned. Nothing would stand. No doctor qualifications, no health and safety qualifications would stand. Literally, it would be the most radical provision. And so we presented argument on behalf of Liberty Council at the Florida Supreme Court, that it should not be on the ballot because it does not satisfy Florida law. In Florida law, to have something on the ballot as an initiative by the individual signatures of people, it must not be deceptive, it must be clear, and it can only address a single subject. But this violates both, and particularly with regards to its deceptiveness. Mm. It is designed to fool the voter to think that some abortion regulation might stand, yeah. but indeed all the abortion regulations and laws will be wiped out with this particular provision. Yeah, you, you said deception. And that's the tactic that it seems like they're using. We saw that in Ohio also recently. Why, why is there such a need for, I mean, that tells us there's a need for discernment in the church. What do you have to say about that? There's got to be a need for discernment, and it doesn't take a lot of spiritual discernment to figure yeah. out what's going on with this particular issue. This is a death culture, and it is a lying culture to deceive the people mm. into thinking that this is a choice or this is freedom or reproductive yeah. freedom, when what we're doing is we are committing genocide against innocent, helpless children. In the case of Florida, the reason why I think it's so important for the rest of the country is mm -hmm. there are about a dozen states that are trying to push this abortion amendment on the ballot in November. And that's just in 2024. We're going to have more states do that. And Ohio, mm. unfortunately, went the wrong way it because did. the church did not get involved yes. and vote this issue. But in Florida, for example, the chief justice of the state of Florida's uh, Supreme Court asked a question. And he asked the question about what the ballot summary does not say. So when you go and you vote, there's a summary of what the constitutional amendment would be what it does and it's supposed to be fair and accurate this one doesn't say that it's going to impact existing rights of the unborn child so the chief justice said i'm concerned about what it doesn't say because in article one section two of the florida constitution it says a natural person has a right to life that may include an unborn child and that's a very significant thing so we filed yeah. additional laws in florida with the florida supreme court that are in every state. Criminal law, if you kill the pregnant mother and the child, you have double homicide because of the unborn child is a person. If you do some kind mm. of civil action, injure the child, civil liability against the unborn child. If you have a will and you die, 
and you have individual recipients that are alive, but one of them is in the womb, that unborn child, according to the Florida law in every state, and they use the term unborn child, is legally protected as someone who has property rights. So you appoint a guardian for them to argue their property interest. Mm. And so many other areas of law, every area of law, criminal, civil, guardianship, trust and estates, they all recognize the unborn child as yeah. a person entitled to legal rights. And that's in virtually every state. Yeah. So that's what the real question was in this case. When it says person, does that include unborn child? I think it clearly does. And if it does, then what Planned Parenthood is trying to do is take away existing rights of the unborn child and wipe those away so that they have no voice and no rights. That does not just limit this case to Florida because the laws that we have in Florida and that same question in the constitutions of all these other states, those questions and those laws are virtually identical. Yeah. So we can make that argument in all 50 states. It's interesting. Uh, on one of the government websites, and it's a medical government website, if you Google this, of course, I say this now, they're probably going to wipe it off the Internet. When does life begin? And this government medical website says at the moment of conception. Yes. And that's so important. Um, so all of this is coming because of the ruling of the Supreme Court. Right. Right. From last year. And so we're going to see this more in states. Have we seen any wins Yes, we've seen a lot of wins. Let me just give you an example. Since Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Dobbs decision, we have about four to 5,000 babies per month that are born now. Man. That otherwise would have been aborted. So we're talking about tens and tens of thousands of babies that are alive that will celebrate their first birthday and they'll graduate and they'll go on to be productive in their lives because that decision was overturned. And so that is a huge change. And those numbers will wow. continue to increase. No wonder why Planned Parenthood with its abortion industry that funds its operation in the yeah. billions of dollars is so intent on passing these laws to change the Constitution to continue this genocide. This mm. is a critical moment in our history. In the last 50 years, we've been under the shadow of this deathly Roe versus Wade decision, and yeah. it's gone now. Yeah. And now the church needs to get involved and needs to vote for the right kind of people yeah. to protect our laws in all these states. Because the battle has moved now from the federal level at yeah. the U.S. Supreme Court to the individual states. And yeah. that's where the battle is, and that's where the churches need to be. So I'll tell our audience, in case they don't know, you, you are a pastor, okay? We won't hold that against you because I'm also a pastor. Well, um, the interesting thing, Matt, yeah. how I became a lawyer was when I was a pastor in 1983, two people wanted Tell us, yeah. they, they wanted to educate some pastors. So I was one of about 12 pastors that they invited to show a brand new documentary at the time called Assignment Life. And had you asked me my position on abortion back then, I would have repeated what was in the liberal media because I didn't do my own research. Wow. I knew all the biblical languages and I was a pastor graduated from seminary, but I didn't know this important cultural issue in my backyard. And when I saw a first trimester suction tube abortion mm. and they reassembled the baby body parts, it hit me like a ton of bricks. This is a real person. Mm. This is not some blob of tissue that the media tries to make it sound like. Yeah. And that's what was the turning point to get me involved in wow. how my faith should be intersecting with and impacting our culture. Yeah. And I could have been very well versed mm. in every area of the Bible, but my faith was bypassing the most important cultural issue in my community. Yeah. And that got me involved in the intersection of faith and law and policy. And that led me to law school and eventually the founding of Liberty Council. Yeah. And I applaud what you're doing, because when we look at the founding of our country, there were pastors on the front line. Yeah leading this revolution, you know, in, into what God has given us in this nation. We have a lot of people that watch this and they're part of churches all across denominations. Some of their pastors are speaking out about issues. Some of them are not. I want to go twofold on this. Number one, what's your advice to pastors who may not feel like they're, they, they can speak on these issues? 
political issues, even though they're not technically, they're biblical issues, life, gender, marriage. Like, what's your advice to these pastors? Well, these are biblical issues. And so as they study the Bible, they need to study these issues because if they're not, they're not reading the whole counsel of God's word. Yeah. But if they are really out of their league on some of these, which they shouldn't be because they need to spend time to understand and learn, then bring in guest speakers. Yeah. You have people in your congregation that can speak. You have opportunities to bring in individuals to speak in your church and have presentations. What I would say is don't shy away from these issues and don't think, well, number one, if I do this, I'll lose my tax exempt status. That's the biggest myth. No church has ever lost its tax exempt (laughs) status for speaking on these kinds of issues or on political matters for that matter. No church has ever done that. Yeah. Number two, don't be afraid of the people in your congregation that you might lose them. Because there's a way to speak on life by having grace and the passion and the compassion of the yeah. Lord Jesus Christ, but yet upholding a standard. In fact, if you don't speak on this issue, if you don't speak on this issue, whether it's abortion or LGBTQ issues, what you are doing is dooming your people to destruction. Wow. Because you're not giving them information that otherwise would Man. allow them to not go so down true. this road to kill their unborn child yeah. and not only kill that precious child, but damage their own self yeah. as a mother and as a woman or on the LGBTQ issue. You've got to speak on this because parents and yeah. people in your congregation are dealing with it. So address it openly, biblically. And I think people will flock to churches and pastors that speak on current relevant issues. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah, that's so good so so then what about the the lay person who may be in a church that their pastor is not speaking out what's your encouragement to them like what can they do for their pastor you know because i know like people are like hey you should be doing this you should be doing this so it's less on the shooting side and more of like what can they do to encourage their pastor Well, you know what they need to do is they need to encourage the pastor, pray for the pastor, but they need to not give up and, in fact, uh, insist that these biblical issues are talked about and addressed because they're very critical. At some point, if there's no movement, then I think, frankly, people need to find a different church. Yeah. You know, my wife had a, a dream back in January of 2020 before we went into COVID. And the dream was that most people have attended a place of entertainment as opposed to a place of worship. Mm. And then lo and behold, we went into COVID and people were very content with just staying home. And many people are still staying home. And what we find is that church was not essential for some people. Mm. And yet church is very, very, very essential. And so consequently, find a place that is preaching the word of God try to get your pastor to to do so but if your pastor just is insistent and is not following the whole counsel of the bible then it may be time to seek out other churches and what we've seen since covid is exactly that we've yeah. seen churches where pastors are not speaking to these current day issues from a biblical yeah. perspective losing members and churches where pastors are speaking gaining members not yeah. only in their church but online as well yeah people yeah. are hungry for biblical truth they sure are i see that too where i'm at you do a lot for life you also do a lot for religious freedom um just quickly wh- where do you see that where we are now when it comes to religious freedom is it under attack in america well religious freedom is clearly under attack but let me say this we have more religious freedom now than we have had in the last 50 years and i'll give you an example in yeah. 1971 the supreme court handed down Lemon versus Kurtzman. Yep. That was the decade of the 70s. You had Lemon versus Kurtzman. It damaged the First Amendment, free exercise clause, free speech clause, and establishment clause. Mm-hmm. And they did it on purpose. 1973, you had Roe versus Wade abortion. 1977, the Supreme Court of that decade weakened the protections for Title Seven people of faith in the workplace. Yep. 1978, they had the affirmative action for admissions. Mm-hmm. Between 20... 22, 2023, all four of those cases have been overturned. Hmm. We now have more religious freedom with that 1971 Lemon case gone than we have had for 50 years. So where are we? You're in a situation where you've been in a cage for 50 years. Now the door is open. What do people do? They still want to 
stay in the cage. We need to encourage people to go out and exercise their freedom, whether it's Bible clubs in the schools, whether it's churches, yeah. whether it's uh, having the opportunity for your own religious Christian viewpoint in the public square. We have a lot of opportunity now to speak freely and to worship and have our religious freedom protection protected than we have had for 51 plus years. Yeah. So real quick, I know we're, we're almost out of time. On the subject of religious freedom, what do you say to that per person that says, keep religion out of the state? Well, I don't see how you keep religion out of the state. That's impossible uh, because if you keep religion out of the state, what are you going to have in there? You're going to have secularism and yeah. you're going to be governed by a very secular institution. That's going to be very hostile to your yeah. faith. And so we're not talking about having the church impose doctrine to impose it on everyone else. But we are saying that, you know, this idea of this church state separation, the real idea is the state should not come in and micromanage and tell the church how to believe. Yes. But it was never intended to prevent people of faith, believers, from going into the public square, right. going into the political arena, not and, only running for office and being office holders, but impacting those who are. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. It's always good to be with a brother in Christ, another pastor. Matt, thank you so much for everything you're doing. And uh, My Faith Votes is behind you. And we are praying for you and everything that you're doing. And we're so encouraged by the work that God's doing and, and how God is using you. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah.